Well, good afternoon. Um, my sermon tonight is called The Local Church. So I'll be preaching about the local church. And uh, what I want to do tonight is uh, look at some scriptures that you don't normally uh, go straight to when you're preaching a sermon about the local church. So hopefully you'll, you'll see some, um, some different aspects to the local church, which you don't normally consider. And um, when I did start to prepare the sermon, I had a great appreciation for how zealous God is over the local church and how serious he takes it. So hopefully some of these things will come through tonight uh, in the sermon. And what I want to do is uh, look at the story from Mark chapter 6, the feeding of the 5,000, and look at a spiritual application of that story to see how it applies to the local church. And often in the Gospels, there is a spiritual application behind the obvious meaning. Like, for example, when Jesus heals lepers, um, lep leprosy is often a picture of sin. So you can take the secondary application and say, look, Jesus healing a leper is like when we get saved, when we be, um, we're saved from our sin, since leprosy is a picture of sin. So there is that secondary application. Same with um, Peter walking on the water. There's the obvious application that Peter had faith and Jesus called him to come walk on the water, so he did. But the secondary application could be that we need to walk by faith. As a Christian, we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. And that can be a secondary application. So I want to look at the secondary application from the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark chapter 6. So turn there to Mark chapter 6 and verse 31. And also in the sermon tonight, I want to show, like I said, how zealous God is over the local church. I also want to look at how important it is that there's good pastors in local churches and how much of an emphasis the Bible has on good pastors, good shepherds, and how serious it is when you have a, a local church with saved people in it and the pastor's a bad pastor, and look at how serious God takes that as well. So these are things that will come through in the sermon tonight. So you're there, Mark chapter 6, verse 31. It says there, And he said unto them, Come ye yourselves apart into a desert place and rest a while. For there were many coming and going, and they had no leisure so much as to eat. And they departed into a desert place by ship privately. And the people saw them departing, and many knew him, and ran afoot hither out of all cities, and out went them, and came together unto Jesus. So what we see here is Jesus in a desert place. And people catch wind that he's out there, so you have multitudes of people, well actually 5,000 men, follow him out into the desert to gather around him, but they're congregating around Jesus. And, uh, and these people, it says here that many knew him. So these aren't like your Pharisees or your Sadducees. These people aren't rushing out there to try and catch him out or persecute him or throw stones at him. These people, it says, they actually knew him. So I would say a lot of these people would have been saved. They probably believed Moses and the prophets. And now they have listened to John the Baptist preach about this Jesus. And now they they start to know him. And they say, this guy is probably the Messiah. Or oh, let's go and find out. So these people with a genuine heart to seek after the Lord are, are going out there into the wilderness or into the desert place to gather around. And we know there's 5,000 men. And back in those days, you know, men and women, they had big families. So it wouldn't be unusual to think there'd be like 15,000 people there, 10,000 people, maybe even more. So back in those days, like that's a multitude of people to, to gather together in a desert place. So it's not like it's at Malula Bar. It's not like it's at the beach. It's in a desert place. And Jesus can pull this huge crowd and this crowd congregates around him so have a look there it says um that's a, first of all this picture of jesus in the wilderness or in the desert is not too dissimilar to what you have the picture of moses being in in the in the wilderness also with a great group of people gathering around him so it's a similar picture so have a look at acts chapter 7 Verse 37, so definitely keep a bookmark there in Mark 6. So we're going to go for a few more verses there. And turn to Acts chapter 7 and verse 37. And let's have a look at Moses when he was in the wilderness. And just see what the Bible says there. It says there, This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me, him shall ye hear. So Moses is saying, God's going to raise up unto you a prophet like me 
And if you think about Moses' life, he spent 40 years with a massive congregation of people around about him in the wilderness for 40 years. So you think that maybe Jesus' life might reflect that in some sort of way. And we do see that. We do see that in the feeding of the 5,000. We're going to talk more about that tonight. Keep going down to verse 38. It says there, this is he, speaking of Moses, that was in the church in the wilderness. With the angel which spoke to him in the, in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. So what Moses had in the wilderness, the Bible calls a church. Calls a church. So what I want to do now is just quickly look at what the definition in the Bible is of a church. So I won't get you to turn this on. Most of you guys probably have heard this already. So I'm not preaching anything new here, but let me just read to you the, the definition of a church. So Hebrews 2, uh, verse 11 from there, it says, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church, I will sing praise unto, unto thee. So this, this is a quote from Psalm 22, uh, verse 22. And that says, I will declare my, my name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise thee. So we see it's called congregation in the Old Testament and then it's translated to be church in the New Testament. So we can see a congregation is the same as a church. So Moses had a, pe a bunch of people congregating around him in the wilderness, which was a church. And Jesus, you see him, 5,000 men, congregating around him in, in the wilderness. And it's a church. It's a picture of that, of that type of a church. And as we go through, you see that become more clearer. So turn there back to uh, Mark chapter 6. So we can see by definition, Jesus had a church in a desert place, which is like a type of what Moses had. And verse 34, And Jesus, when he came out, saw much people and was moved with compassion towards them because they were as sheep, not having a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. So we can see there that Jesus had compassion on the people that came out. And he didn't have compassion on them because they were poor, because they were hungry, or because they were sick. It says he had compassion upon them because they were like sheep, not having a shepherd. Okay, And, and then Jesus then becomes their shepherd because he sees they don't have a shepherd, he has compassion for them, and then he becomes the shepherd. And the word shepherd is interchangeable with the word pastor, and I'll show you that later in the sermon. So Jesus sees this this people come around him, 15,000 people, maybe more, and he has compassion because there's no one to lead him. And then he becomes their pastor. And what does he do as their pastor? It says there, and he began to teach them many things. So that's what a pastor does, teaches the people. Okay, so if a pastor has compassion for his, for his flock, he's going to teach them the word of God. So if you see a pastor who doesn't teach them the word of God, he doesn't really have compassion for the people. He's got an alternate agenda, okay? Because if you're passionate for God's people, you're going to give them what's best. And that's the word of God. You're not going to go to the world and get some worldly philosophy or, or you know, go to um, some secular source and give them some self-help sermon like your best life now. Like Joel Olstein doesn't, he doesn't care for the sheep. He has, doesn't have compassion. Jesus had compassion. He became their, their shepherd their pastor, and taught them the word of God. So in this regard, Jesus is picturing Moses' church. Because Moses, in his church in the wilderness, Hebrews chapter, I think, 2 says that he was faithful in all his house. And house, now we're going to look at that in a moment, the house of God is also the church of God. So Moses was faithful in his house, and then Jesus gives a picture of the church that Moses had, and Jesus, of course, is faithful also in, in that church. But what we're going to see here is Jesus is then going to move away from that Im imagery of the church that Moses had into the local church. And that's what I'm going to show you in, in a moment. Turn there to, uh, so you're in Mark chapter 6, go to verse 35. We'll pick it up there. It says there, And when the day was now far spent, his disciples came unto him and said, this is a desert place, and now the time is far past. Send them away, that they may go into the country round about and into the villages, and buy themselves bread, for they have nothing to eat. 
He answered and said unto them, Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, Shall we go and buy two hundred penny worth of bread and give them to eat? So that the disciples are going to Jesus. They're going to the shepherd. They're going to the pastor. And they're saying, Well, you need to send everybody away. You need to send everybody into the, um, the country round about and into the villages to buy food. But because this is a picture of the church, Jesus doesn't want to scatter the sheep. He doesn't want the sheep to be scattered. So actually, he then says to the disciples, no, we're not going to scatter the sheep because this is a picture of a church. Because now you feed them. Okay, you feed them. And a true pastor, like Jesus, is not going to do anything to scatter the sheep because he has compassion because they don't have a shepherd and he wants to feed them and keep them together and see them grow. So a pastor is not going to then just quit. Or not to anyway, or not to quit, because then the sheep are going to be scattered. And he has compassion on the sheep. Okay, so that's something you need to be mindful of when it comes to being a pastor. Like, if you, if you say yes to being a pastor, you're committed to the end. That's part of taking on that commitment. And we're going to see further uh, along in the sermon that it's no small thing uh, to become a pastor or become a shepherd over the Lord's flock. And it's the devil that wants to scatter God's sheep. It's the devil that wants to scatter God's sheep, get them away from the shepherd so they can be then devoured or rendered useless to the kingdom of God. And uh, we don't want to line up with the devil and scatter the sheep. So we see Jesus then setting out under shepherds. So rather than scattering the sheep like the disciples suggested, Jesus is actually putting in greater measures to see that they're looked after. So it's not just one man trying to attend to 20,000 people. He then sends out his apostles, his disciples, to look after them. It says there in verse 38, He saith unto them, How many loaves have ye? Go and see. And when they knew, they say, Five and two fishes. So he finds some loaves or some bread. And bread is a picture of, of doctrine. A picture of teaching God's word. So turn there to Matthew chapter 16. Keep your bookmark there in Mark. Matthew chapter 16, verse 6. Excuse me. I'll just show you there how uh, bread is a picture of, of uh, teaching the word of God or doctrine. And this is after... Jesus had fed the 5,000, as recorded in Matthew. It says there, Then Jesus said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And they reasoned among themselves, saying, It is because we have taken no bread, which when Jesus perceived, he said unto them, O ye of little faith, why reason ye among yourselves, because ye have brought no bread? Do ye not yet understand, nor remember the five loaves of the 5,000, and how many baskets ye took up? Neither the seven loaves of the four thousand, and how many baskets you took up? How is it that you do not understand that I spake to you, I spake it not to you concerning bread, that you should be aware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees? Then understood they how that he, ba he bade them not beware of the leaven of bread, but of the doctrine of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So bread is a picture of teaching doctrine. So he sends out his disciples then to, to feed the sheep bread, okay? And many of these um, disciples that Jesus sent out went on to become pastors, um, apostles, those sort of ministries where they would be teaching people. So Jesus is actually getting them to do a, a natural or physical demonstration of what they're going to be doing spiritually, kind of like when Jesus called the, um, the fishermen and said, like, you've been fishing for, for fish, now you're going to become fishers of men. That's the same idea here where they become they're becoming pastors, they're going to feed God's people, but now Jesus is getting them to do like a natural example of that. And the spiritual meaning behind that is they're going to be giving spiritual food in the future. They're going to become shepherds or pastors like Jesus was. Verse 39, this gets interesting now. And he commanded them to make all sit down by companies upon the green grass, and they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. Now you might think it's a bit strange that it's recorded in there that they sat down on green grass. But if there's no spiritual meaning behind it, if there's no spiritual application, then who cares what the grass was like when they sat down? If it was just about only feeding the, the um, disciples or the followers of Jesus bread, then who cares if they sat down on dirt or yellow grass 
or dry grass from the Sunshine Coast, or green grass, it doesn't matter. But however, if there's a, 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 another meaning behind it, then it becomes very significant. A couple of weeks ago, Pastor Kevin preached a sermon from um, the Song of Solomon. He talked about the, the, the bed being green. And he was saying the, the, uh, the green represents the bed is um, fruitful and, and fertile. And it's the same here. Like they're sitting down on, on fertile, fruitful land. Okay, what's another name for, um, another word for grass? Pasture. So Jesus is making the disciples sit down in green pastures. Do you see where I'm heading now? So they turn there to um, Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Verse 1. says there, the Lord is my shepherd, which is what we're talking about, right? I shall not want, he maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. So can you see the, the connection there to Psalm 23? That the, Jesus maketh them sit down in green pastures and he's about to feed them the bread. Or green grass is how it's mentioned there. But if you look up the meaning of grass, then pastures there is one of the main meanings. Okay. Now jump down to verse 6, and we're going to see a stronger connection now to the local church. Psalm 23 verse 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So this is an Old Testament picture of the local church. The local church is a place of green pasture, where we can sit down in fertile green pasture and receive the word of God. And let me read to you 1 Timothy 3.15, chapter 3, verse 15. Don't turn there, I'll just read it. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the church. So when we talk about the house of the Lord or the house of God, that's the church as we know it today, the local church. So we can see there the local church is likened to green pasture. But the local church... It's a place where you can be fruitful, where you can increase as a Christian and uh, where you can have the word of God preached to you. So we can also see that Jesus commands the, uh, the congregation, the church, to be not scattered but broken up into smaller congregations in groups of... Uh, let's have a look there. Oh, it was... Uh, there we go. And they sat down in ranks by hundreds and by fifties. So the, the, the apostles, the disciples are being sent out now into smaller churches, into local churches of fifties and, and the hundreds. So Jesus is putting in greater measures to make sure these people are cared for, that they receive the, uh, the physical food that they need, which is a picture of local churches, because what we have today is smaller groups. We don't have the big church like Moses. We now have local churches of 50s or 100, or if the, the local pastor has the capacity to attend to a larger one, then we can have larger ones still today. But the idea is that we have local church. So Jesus is picturing the Old Testament type church that Moses had, and now he's transitioning to like a prophetic type of the soon to come local church. So back to Mark chapter 6, verse 41. It says there, And when he had taken the five loaves and the two fishes, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to his disciples to set before them. And the two fishes divided he among them all. So what we see here, this is a great picture of what a pastor does. So Jesus breaks the bread gives it to the disciples, and then the disciples take the same bread they got from Jesus and give it to the people. So they're not trying to outsource the bread from somewhere else. The bread that Jesus hands to them, they hand to their, their, their group or their congregation or their church. And that's what a pastor does. The pastor takes directly from Jesus and gives that teaching to the church. And, of course, that's, that's from here. That's from the Word of God. That's what a true pastor does, the true shepherd does, will care for the sheep by giving them what they get from Jesus. So Jesus gives the pastor teaching, doctrine, understanding of the scriptures, and then the pastor passes that on to the church. Have a look at, um, go back to Acts 7.38. Acts 7.38. 
And this is actually what Moses did in his church as well, in the wilderness. It says there, this is he, talking about Moses, that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spoke to him in the Mount Sinai and with our fathers, who received the living oracles to give unto us. So Moses literally received the Ten Commandments from God, didn't he? And then he took the Ten Commandments and gave them to the people. And that's exactly what we see the pictured in the feeding of the 5,000. Like the disciples literally take the bread from Jesus and give it to the uh, their local little groups that they've got, got authority over or they're shepherding. That's what we do today. We pass down the same living oracles from God himself to, to the church. So the local church we looked at is a, a green pasture and it's also a place where the very words of God are preached and taught. And a true pastor won't outsource Jesus. Like he won't go and try and, like I said before, he won't go and try and go to the world to get food. Like he'll just get it from Jesus, from the word of God. And uh, let's look at that a bit further. Turn to Jeremiah chapter 3. Jeremiah chapter 3 and verse 14. And we're going to start to see how zealous God is over the local church, over his sheep. Already we've seen Jesus having compassion to his uh, people who don't have a shepherd. And we're going to see that continue on. Verse 14 says, They turn, O backsliding children, saith the Lord, for I am married unto you, and I will take you uh, one of a city and two of a family and bring you to Zion. So Zion is also a picture of the local church. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. So we see a few things there talking about his backslidden children who he's married to. So backslidden Christians who aren't in church, like Jesus wants them to be in church. He wants to seek them out and get them into church and he wants to then put a shepherd over them according to his own heart. So pastors, they really have the heart of Jesus towards their flock, have the heart of compassion. And that's a tall, a tall ask for a pastor to have Jesus' heart. And that's why there's so strict qualifications to actually be a pastor because you have to have the heart of Jesus and you have to care for Jesus' flock who he died for. And I will give you pastors according to mine heart which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding and which of course is the scriptures, the, word of, the words of God. And if Jesus wants to send true pastors and true shepherds to look after the flock, you know the devil then is going to try and send out counterfeit pastors, bad shepherds, which aren't going to feed the flock. Okay, And that's why so many Christians aren't in church today, because they've had these terrible experiences in churches. They've been abused, they haven't been fed, they haven't been healed, they haven't received the word of God, they've been controlled, hurt and manipulated, and they've just left church. And, uh, and that's why you don't see so many in churches. Like when, they, when you go soul winning, like how many Christians say people do you meet which have just been so burnt by church they don't want anything to do with it. That's because the devil sent out those bad pastors that haven't fed the sheep, the sheep, haven't had compassion over them. So turn to Jeremiah chapter 23 now, verse 1. And let's look at what the Bible says about these pastors, these bad pastors. Jeremiah 23, 23 verse 1. It says there, Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. So the God knows about these pastors that scatters the sheep. And actually, the, the polar opposite of what Jesus' heart is. Jesus wants to gather the sheep, but these bad pastors actually cause the sheep to be scattered. And he says, Woe unto those pastors. And a good, a good sheep will ultimately will scatter from a bad shepherd, a bad pastor. You've got to expect that. But woe unto that bad pastor that causes that to happen. Verse 2 there, it says, Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people. So they do feed them, but it's not the word of God. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doings, saith the Lord. So these people, God is going to chase after and he will bring them to account for what they've done. It says there that they have not visited them. So 
So these pastors, they're not hospitable. They don't care for the sheep. You think about Jesus, how many people did he visit? Like he was constantly visiting people. Even Pharisees would invite him to his home and he would visit them. Like Jesus was hospitable. And pastors, it's one of the qualifications for a pastor is to be hospitable. And these uh, bad shepherds aren't hospitable. And in verse 3, it says there, And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them, and will bring them again to their folds, and they shall be fruitful and increase. So we see there that God actually drives away his people from these bad shepherds so they don't be abused any further. But then he wants them to come into good churches. Okay, so we have no excuse really for not being in a good church. I know sometimes there might be a waiting period where you have to make do while you wait, but there's no reason to leave a good church unless you're going to a better church, unless you're going to a church that has even greener pastures. So you should not be leaving a good church. But however, you know you don't want to be in a bad church where, bad, where the pastor's not saved, they're not teaching you the Word of God from the King James Bible, and they're actually feeding on you instead of uh, feeding you. They're trying to feed on you instead of feeding you uh, the Word of God. So we can see here that Jesus still has compassion on this sheep because he still wants them to come back into their folds. And in their folds, in good local churches, they shall be fruitful and increase. That's why the devil wants to scatter the sheep so they can't be fruitful, they can't increase. Now if you, you know, it's pretty hard to be a fruitful soul winner when you're not being sent by a local church. And the devil knows that. But when you are in a good local church, a green pasture, the word of God's preached, you're going to be fruitful and you're going to increase in your knowledge of God, you're going to increase in the fruit that you produce as far as being a, a, an effective soul winner. Uh, verse 4. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord. So have a look here. This is where you see that the word pastor is used interchangeably with shepherd. In Jeremiah 23 verse 1 there, it says, Woe be unto the pastors. And in verse 4 there, the words then change to shepherd. So used interchangeably in the same context there. Again, we see good pastors actually feeding the sheep, and that's what God wants. And often when you're in a bad church, and I've been in plenty of bad churches over the years, and I'm sure some of you guys can attest to that, there's that certain fear that comes, and you feel like dismayed in that church. And dismayed means, let me read it to you, that means to be unnerved, to have apprehension, uh, to feel concern, it means to be like, horrified or appalled. And I felt like that in many churches with bad shepherds. Like you feel fearful because you're, you're fearful like you're not measuring up to God's standard. And also you can feel apprehension, you can feel concern, like something's not right here. I can't put my finger on it, but I'm, but I'm dismayed about this church. And that's a sign that you could well be in a bad church. And at a good church, you're fruitful and increase because you have green pasture and not fearful and, and dismayed in those bad churches. So some pastors, like I said before, they fail to feed the sheep, but they actually look at the sheep as a source for them to feed upon. So have a look at now Ezekiel chapter 34. Ezekiel chapter 34 and verse 1. says there, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God unto the shepherds, Woe be to the shepherds of Israel that do feed themselves. Should not the shepherds feed the flocks? This is what we've been talking about. Ye eat the fat, and ye clothe, uh, and ye clothe you with the wool. Ye kill them that are fed, but ye feed not the flock. So these bad shepherds, they're just looking at their congregations and what can I get from them? Look, they're trying to work out who's got the most money, how can I get the money from these people, and even worse things when they might want to abuse the people, have you know, uh, inappropriate relationships with people in the church, and these bad pastors will just look at what they can get from the church rather than feed them the word of God, they're looking at what they can get, what they can get out of the, out of the congregation, out of the sheep. And verse 4, The diseased have ye not strengthened, neither have ye healed that which was sick, neither have ye bound up that which was broken, neither have ye brought again that which 
was driven away, neither have you sought that which was lost, but with force and with cruelty have you ruled them. So we can see in a good local church, the sick should receive healing. The bound, or the broken, should be bound up, not fed upon. And what happens here is that these pastors, it says there, they rule by force and with cruelty. And verse 5, And they were scattered because there was no shepherd. And they became meat to all the beasts of the field when they were scattered. So that's what happens. When the, the good sheep get scattered, if they don't find themselves into a, a good local church quickly, they actually get preyed upon by the beasts of the field. And that's why Jesus wants to gather his sheep quickly back into a good fold. And the beasts of the field will be false prophets, more bad churches, and they're trying to find good pasture, good green pasture, and they go to these churches and they just get abused more and more, and like the beasts of the field devour them more and more. And verse 6, My sheep wandered through all the mountains, and upon every high hill, ye, my flock was scattered upon all the face of the earth, and none did search or seek after them. So we see here, Jesus still has compassion on the sheep today because he sees these sheep, they don't have a shepherd and there's no one going after them. And when we go soul winning, we need to go after these lost sheep. And that's what we do do. Like, but often, the damage they have received from the, the beasts of the field is too great. I remember one time, I think it was with Brother Callum, we spoke to one lady. Um, she used to go to a, um, a IOG church in the area and she was just so destroyed but an experience she had at this church where she had no interest at all in, in coming to any churches because of what she suffered. And she was like absolutely saved. Was that with you? I think it was with you. And uh, yeah, she was like definitely saved because we said, we asked her, um, um, are you for sure, do you know for sure you're going to go to heaven? And I said, oh, that's what I said. I said, um, what do you have to do to go to heaven? And she like rebuked me and said, I don't have to do anything. It was like a trick question and she, and she caught me out. It's no, it's all by just believing in Jesus. So you're like absolutely saved, but totally burnt by church and just no, no regard at all for, for church because of what the beasts of the field have done. And Jesus has compassion on people like that. When we go soul winning, we're trying to get people saved so they don't go to hell, but also we need to go after these lost sheep and say, look, we found some green pasture. You need to come to our church. And that's what Jesus wants because he's... he's has compassion because people aren't seeking after these sheep and we get to seek after them when we go soul winning. Uh, verse 7 of um, the same chapter there. Therefore, ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, saith the Lord God, surely because my flock become a prey and my flock become meat to every beast of the field because there was no shepherd. Neither did my shepherds search for my flock, but the she shepherds fed themselves and fed not my flock. Therefore, O ye shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. So now he's going to rebuke those shepherds that actually fed on the sheep and don't regard the lost sheep at all. Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I re require my flock at their hand, and cause them to cease from feeding, my, feeding the flock. Neither shall the shepherds feed themselves any more, for I will deliver my flock from their mouth, that they may not be meat for them. So we can see that God gets to the point where he's going to stop these bad shepherds from feeding the flock. So you're not going to be pastors anymore. It gets to the point where I've done with you abusing my sheep and he's going to then deliver the flock from their mouth. That may, that they may not be meat for them anymore. So that's a warning to, to pastors that this bring destruction. They don't feed the sheep. That God can then remove and we do see that happen that God can remove pastors so he can then save the sheep from more destruction. Verse 11. For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, will both search my sheep and seek them out. As the shepherd seek about his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so I will seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day. And I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel by the rivers and in all the inhabited, inhabited 
inhabited places of the country. In verse 14 there, we're going to see God start to describe a good local church. So we looked at some bad pastors, some bad situations that God's sheep can be in, but now we're going to see God describe a really good local church. Verse 14 there says, I will feed them in good pasture, and upon the high mountains of Israel shall their fold be. There shall, there shall they lie, lie in a good fold. Again, another reference to um, Psalm 23. That I'll make them lie down in green pastures. So he's making them lie in a good fold. And in a fat pasture shall they feed upon the mountains of Israel. I will feed my flock. So in a good church, like this church here, for example, like Jesus is literally feeding you guys by the word of God being preached. I will feed my flock and I will cause them to lie down, saith the Lord God. So if you're lying down, like you're not fearful. Like if you're fearful or you're dismayed or you're on edge, like you're not going to lie down. So these good churches, um, in a spiritual sense, you can lie down because you know you're in a good pasture. You know they're good, you've got a good shepherd feeding you the word of God and you're not fearful. I will seek that which was lost and bring again that which was driven away. And I will bind up that which was broken. So if you're a broken person, the local church is where you need to be so you can be healed and uh, bound up. And it will strengthen that which was sick. So the sick can be strengthened in the local church. And I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will feed them with judgment. So the fat and the strong, talking about those bad shepherds that are fat and strong on feeding from the sheep. God says, I'm going to destroy those shepherds. And that's what we need to realise, that God loves us and he's going to feed us, but he also wants us to know that those bad shepherds, he's going to deal with them. They won't go unpunished and he will judge them. Let me read to you Psalm 68 verse 6, another great uh, picture of the local church. It says there, God setteth the solitary in families. He bringeth out those which are bound with chains but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. So if you're a lonely person, you don't have a good natural family, if you're saved and you join a local church, you're going to instantly have a whole massive new family. You're going to have an instant family. And it says there, the rebellious dwell, dwell in a dry land. So if you're saved, but you're rebellious to the command to uh, not forsake the assembly of yourselves together, you're going to be in a dry place. Like, if you leave green pasture, well, you're going to be in a dry place. And don't be deceived by the devil to actually leave a good church. It's going to be worse. It's going to be dry. And then Jesus is going to have compassion on you and say, no, come back. You know, and he's not going to let, let you go forever, but don't, don't leave. You'll be in a, a dry place. And back to uh, Jeremiah. What are we in, Jeremiah? Uh, Ezekiel 34, sorry. So go down to Ezekiel 34, verse 17. It says there, And as for you, O my flock, thus saith the Lord God, behold, I will judge between cattle and cattle, between the rams and the he goats. So here's a warning to those pastors that have destroyed the sheep, that have scattered the sheep and brought destruction. He's going to judge between good cattle, bad cattle, and between the rams and the he goats. Verse 18 Seem if it a small thing unto you to have eaten up the good pasture. So that's interesting. Like these pastors that have eaten the pasture, they haven't fed the church, they've eaten them up and God says, is it a small thing to you that you've done that? Like meaning it's serious business to God if you're going to consume. It's no small thing if you're going to consume the pasture. But ye must tread down with your feet the residue of your pastures, pastures and to have drunk of the deep waters, but you must foul the residue with your feet. So these pastors, they're not teaching the pure word of God. They're actually fouling up the word of God with their feet. They're putting a taint on the word of God. They're bringing um, their own agenda mixed in there with the word of God. They're tainting the word of God with their feet. They're standing in it, they're messing it up. And they pollute and corrupt the word of God. Verse 19, And as for my flock, they eat that which you have trodden with your feet and they drink that which you have fouled with your feet. So they're messing up the word of God. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God unto them, Behold, I, even I, will judge between the fat cattle and between the lean cattle, because you have thrust with side and with shoulder and pushed all the diseased 
with your horns till you have scattered them abroad. So these pastors are supposed to care for the disease, but these bad pastors actually attack the diseased, actually attack the people in the church that are, are sick and need healing. Instead of bringing them the word of God, they're attacking them. And that's not going to get unpunished. Verse 22. Therefore will I save my flock, and they shall no more be a prey, and I will judge between cattle and cattle. I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them. Even my servant David, he shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. So again, we see God wanting to get these uh, his sheep away from these bad pastors that attack them and don't feed them, and give them a shepherd like David who will feed them. The, the word of God. So we, we can start to see a picture here that, that God is really zealous over his flock, isn't he? Like he's zealous over saved Christians, over the local church, because he's against those pastors that are abusing them. Like he's zealous. Turn to John chapter 2, John chapter 2, verse 13, a very famous uh, passage of scripture here. Let's have a look at it. John chapter 2, and we're just about near the end of the sermon. Yep, just about the end now. So you're there in John chapter 2, verse 13. It says there, and the Jews' Passover was at hand. And Jesus went up to Jerusalem and found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changes of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changes' money and overthrew the tables and said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence, make not my father's house and house of merchandise. And his disciples remember that it was written, The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. So God is zealous over his house. And we can see that come through in, in Jeremiah, in the passage there in Ezekiel, that he's zealous. He's zealous over this house right here. He's zealous that this house will be green pasture, and praise God that it is. And he wants every house, every local church, to be green pasture. He's zealous over them, and that they wouldn't then... like making merchandise of you like these bad pastors they want to make merchandise so they see you as dollar signs and that upsets jesus more than anything else like people could call him beelzebub and all these sort of things he's like whatever but when they start to abuse the sheep it gets mad it's it really mad and he's so zealous over the local church so we can start to see why then we would have very strict qualifications to be a shepherd if Jesus is so zealous that shepherds would be good, then we've got to expect some pretty strict criteria to be a pastor. Because you have to have his heart, remember? And these are his sheep that he's purchased with his own blood. And you need to be qualified to do that. Because you look at people who are unqualified and it's a disaster. Let's quickly just go through not all, of, all the qualifications, but just a few. If you like, turn there to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1. So in light of some of the things that we looked at already, let's go through the qualifications and it might make a bit more, um, bit more impact. It says, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. So we can see it's a good work to feed the sheep. It's a good work to provide that green pasture, to provide that local church where people can be fruitful and increase. That's a good work. It's probably the best work you can do on planet Earth. Like, it's not being the president, it's not being some head of some company. The highest position on earth is to be a shepherd, to be a pastor, and look after the sheep that Jesus has purchased with his own blood. So it is a good work. It's a great work. It's the best work you can do. A bishop there must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behaviour, given to hospitality. Remember, you can visit people, you're a hospitable type of a person. And you're apt to teach. So you've got to be able to teach the word of God. Because you've got to feed the sheep. So if you're not apt to teach, you can't be a pastor. Not given to wine, no striker, not greedy or filthy lucre. Because you don't want to be tempted then to feed on the sheep. If you're greedy for filthy lucre, you can do that. But patient, uh, not a brawler, not covetous. One that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. So if you can't have your family as a green pasture, how can you have God's church as a green pasture? So our family, they should be little green pastures where they are fruitful, where they, our children increase and they learn the word of God and they're, and they're in subjection 
to God's word, they're in subjection to their parents. And the wife's in, in subjection to the husband. And the husband then lays down his life for his wife, like Jesus lays down his, his life for the church. So if, so if you're going to be a pastor, you need to make sure that your church is like a, a little green pasture. And verse 5, For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, as being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. All right. Now let's go back to Mark chapter 6. We'll wrap it up now. Mark chapter 6 and verse 42. And so now the, all the, um, the, the followers of Jesus have been fed and says there, and they did all eat and were filled. Again, to apply that to the local church, everyone in the local church, the, the children, the older folks, all should eat and be filled. Again, Pastor Kevin talked about this morning, we don't ship off our young people or our toddlers somewhere else. They're in the church here, in the local church right now, being fed by the bread from Jesus. Okay, and even our children from the youngest, the ones that are asleep right now, to, to the oldest, all should be able to receive the word of God and be fed. Okay, so I just want to read to you from John 4.13. Don't need, no need to turn there, I'll just read it to you. It says there, Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, meaning natural water from the well, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I first not, neither come hither to draw. And that water is found, first of, all, first of all, in Christ, but in the local church. That's where the tap's turned on, on that living water is in the local church, where that living bread is handed down from Jesus to the local church. Okay, back to Mark 6, verse 43. And the last verse for the day, and they took up twelve baskets full of fragments and of the fishes. So even after they've all been fed and uh, are full, there's still twelve baskets left over. And brother Sam and myself were talking about this the other day, that you can read a book in the Bible fifty times and there's still twelve baskets left over. You can never out eat the word of God. So in a local church like this. We could go on for 500 years and there'd still be 12 baskets left over to consume. But the church really is a place of abundance of the Word of God, which causes such blessing. Okay, so that's my sermon for this afternoon. I hope that's been a blessing to you, that you can just see how zealous God is for the local church and how vital it is that we are in, in a local church. We're in the green pasture. We're being fed by the Word of God so we can be fruitful and increase and uh, be blessed by God. All right, thank you very much.